In these days of deepening darkness for the Northern Hemisphere, we will try to shed a little bit of light today on the daylight saving debate. Health damaging, life improving, mainly annoying. Well, perhaps it's time to wind the clocks back to an earlier time and say goodbye to all those tweaks in our time zones. Hello, welcome to Roundtable. I'm David Foster. It was in the First World War that we saw the clocks changed across large parts of Europe to save energy during wartime. It's been back and forth ever since. In the UK, we have just got an extra hour in bed and lost an hour of daylight in the evening. In this part of the world, at least, there are a growing number of people and governments who say it's time to change the time changes. Spring forward, fall back. It's the seasonal time shift known as daylight saving. But why do some countries still do it? And is it worth our time? Daylight saving was first implemented by Germany during World War I. It was seen as a way to utilize the extra hours of sunlight in summer and conserve energy. Today the concept is used by about 20% of the world's population, including most of Europe, North America and parts of the Southern Hemisphere where greater seasonal change is experienced. There are also proposals to introduce it in Japan ahead of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. But is the shifting of an early sunrise to a longer evening still beneficial? The EU Commission is considering a proposal to stop daylight saving after a survey found most Europeans oppose it. In Britain, there are growing calls to switch to British summertime all year round. Russia ended the practice in 2010 after the then president deemed it too disruptive. Мы действительно привыкли каждую весну и осень переводить стрелки часов и все по привычке на это ругаться, потому что реально нарушается биоритм человеческий, все это раздражает, там все либо просыпают, либо просыпаются рано и не знают, куда себя деть в течение лишнего часа. While in Australia, only three of its six states changed their clocks, turning the country's three time zones into five, six months of the year. How does the lack of continuity affect business and communication in an increasingly interconnected world? London, New York and Sydney stagger their clock changes across three weeks, twice a year. The hour time difference also affects natural sleep rhythms, which can impact productivity. And the concept is based on a 9 to 5 working model, which is being replaced by flexible hours. Daylight saving has become a way of life for millions of people around the globe. It adds an extra hour to long evenings in summer and is said to be a better use of time. But are the biannual clock changes too disruptive to society? And is it putting some countries out of sync with the rest of the world? Time to get going. Uh, I'm pleased to say, very pleased to say that from Boston in the United States we have David Preyrout, author of Seize the Daylight, the curious and contentious story of daylight saving time. Also on Skype from Boston, we have the psychiatrist, Dr. Emily Deans, and with me in the studio, Christopher Snowden, head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and Anna Rolls, curator of the Clockmakers Museum here in London. Warm welcome to each and every one of you. D David, I read the subtitle of your book, which is a contentious story of daylight saving. Why is it such a difficult subject for people to agree on? It's been contentious for a long time because, uh, though it, in general, most people like to have the extra hour of daylight in the evening, in the summer. Uh, some people don't. Some people are morning people and rather have an extra hour of daylight in the morning. And there's, sometimes you can't go get those people to agree. And so we've had contention throughout its history. When, when did it all start? I heard Benjamin Franklin's name mentioned. 
Correct. Benjamin Franklin had the first concept of daylight saving time, which uh, he used to sleep late every uh, every morning and get up around noontime when he was U.S. ambassador to France. And one day he woke up early and he saw the light shining in his window. And he realized that if he woke up early or closer to sunrise, he'd be able to make better use of that daylight instead of having to uh, light his house in the evening with expensive candles. So he had the idea of trying to get up earlier, closer to sunrise to make better use of daylight. But it didn't really become a good a concept that came to what we have today until a man named William Willett in the early 1900s living outside of London used to wake up early each morning, go on a morning horseback ride and find that everybody else was sleeping. And he felt this beautiful morning hour in the spring and summer was being wasted. So he wrote a booklet called The Waste of Daylight, and that's where the concept spread. Eventually, Germany heard of it and put it in during World War I. See, what I'm wondering, and Anna, maybe you, you can tackle this one, is why didn't somebody just say, this is our time and it's going to stay that way? Well, I think, um, as David had said, in the summertime, we have such long hours of uh, sunlight, mostly because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, so the, the northern hemisphere where we are now, we get um, a much, much longer uh, daylight rather than nighttime. Um, whereas in the winter time, you know, the days of uh, the hours of sunlight are really reduced. And so if you were to keep summertime all year round, you'd find that actually those hours of sunlight in the winter time would mean that you'd end up having long um, mornings of darkness and then you'd have your evening sunlight. Okay, so let's have a hands up amongst the four of you here. Who thinks it's better to be brushing your teeth in the dark and then taking the dog out for a walk because you've got an extra hour of sunlight in the evening. The majority of people I know feel that way, that it doesn't really matter if it's dark in the morning. And a personal opinion. Well, it's easy for you to say that because you live here down in the south of England. If you were to go up further north, you wouldn't, it, it would be around 10 o'clock in the uh, deepest part of the winter before you actually see sunlight. And I think there's an argument that says that people, children walking to school, it's more dangerous. No children walk to school these days. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my arguments. They don't walk to school. <laughs> Nobody's, nobody feels safe, whether it's daylight or not, letting their children walk to school these days. So, in favour or against? Longer evenings? I'm the same as you. Yeah, I, I would rather take my leisure after work than before it. And uh, it comes down to a, a kind of trade-off. Uh, it comes down to a compromise with Scotland, as you quite rightly say. It would be, get pretty uh, dingy in the mornings in Scotland. But, you know, life is pretty tough in the highlands of Scotland anyway. You know, it's, uh, it's rather like, um, you know, some of the Scandinavian countries. You, just, you have very long nights regardless. Um, I... Personally, I think the current compromise we have is pretty good. I think, actually, we should be putting the clocks forward in February rather than March. I think most people would be fairly happy with that. It's really just December and January that are the problematic uh, months for this. But it comes down, really, between a battle um, of early risers versus late risers, and people gather the evidence based on uh, their personal preference, I think. Emily, uh, Anna, I'm going to come back to you to talk about clocks in just a moment, but I want to go to Emily now. And, and, and with your study of the human brain and circadian rhythms and so on, the way it affects people, is it the change that makes people uh, more prone to accidents or is it the fact that, um, that it's darker in the evening perhaps um, than it is in, in winter in, in a lot of places? I don't think they know 100% for sure from the studies that have been done. It's certainly the change uh, seems to be problematic when you look at how circadian rhythms are entrained. And there aren't a ton of studies. You know, there's really only been a few hundred individuals that they've studied in different areas very closely and carefully watching, you know, their melatonin levels and their and when they wake up and their activity and how their sleep changes. What they've basically found with daylight saving that most people lose about an hour of sleep in the springtime or a week or two. We're already a pretty sleep deprived country, at least here in America. And I know a lot of the Western world has uh, trouble with sleep deprivation. So that could be a big health problem. You multiply that over millions and millions and millions of people. Okay, uh, one thing you've mentioned is, is um, in Denmark, northern countries where the, the daylight hours would be much shorter anyway because of where they're positioned on the globe. I think it was something like 11% increase in hospitalizations for depression immediately after the clocks were put back, in other words, when you get shorter evenings? 
Yes, in the in the six weeks after daylight savings time in Denmark, when they look back over the last 50 or 60 years, they found that increase. They're not 100% sure why. There's an old sailing, saying, you know, early to bed, early to rise makes you happy, healthy, and wise. Well, people who sleep later tend to be more depressed, and people who are more depressed tend to sleep later. There's actually wake therapies where they wake people up earlier in the morning, and that can help temporarily a depression. So there's this theory that having everybody sleep later for one hour suddenly can cause an increase in depression in the population to those who are vulnerable. Now, what they didn't find was a compensatory decrease in the amount of depression in the springtime. They don't really know why that is. Yes, it's extraordinary. I mean, I, I once read that springtime is the, the, the prime time uh, for people with suicidal thoughts because they see the world getting better, but they don't feel as though they're getting better. So it's, it's a very complicated set of circumstances, isn't it? David, do you want to say something on this? Yes, I think uh, overall daylight saving time is an excellent compromise. It allows us to have uh, daylight uh, later in the evening for most of the year when there is a lot of daylight. But in the times of year when there's not much, we can use it in the it, so people don't have to get up, as mentioned, in the dark, go to work in the dark, send their kids to school in the dark. And I do think that uh, that one hour uh, time change is not much different than traveling from London to Paris or uh, Chicago to New York, where you lose an hour. And one thing I have been proposing recently is that I think people don't know that the change is coming. And so that one hour hits them right away, and a lot of them get affected by it. If, the, uh, if we would uh, tell people a week or two in advance, prepare for the hour change and maybe go to sleep a little earlier, a little bit during that week before the change, I think that might uh, lessen some of those problems at the transition. See, a lot of it came about because clocks two and 300 years ago were not very accurate. Am I right here, Anna? And then suddenly they became very precise and um, the old sundial went out of the window. Well, yes, I, I mean, before the use of clocks, people were much more in sync with the day and the daylight, and they would use um, markers for the hours of the day using something like a sundial, and actually that divided the day into 12 equal hours of sunlight rather than an hour like we know today. Um, once clocks... Um, were introduced, they, because these hours changed throughout the year, in the summertime you'd have a much longer hour and in the wintertime a much shorter hour, designing a clock that could actually um, follow that rhythm was, was much harder. So they, they, they started to um, use mechanical systems that were more equal and so we started to get equal hours. Um, and once uh, the pendulum had been introduced in the 17th century. The uh, clocks were actually improving so much that we were able to see a difference between the Sunday, a solar day, and a, and a clock day. And it actually varied throughout the year by as much as a 16 minutes, between 14 and 16 minutes, it would be out. And so we had to develop something called a mean uh, mean time, and that would be an average. Which is why we call it day. Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah, GMT. and it was an average yeah. length of day uh, that a clock would it would run to that same length every day. So we've actually been meddling with time versus the um, Earth's time for a very long time. And and in fact, as David said, when we developed uh, time zones in the 19th century and the 20th century. The, uh, the, the communication was improving. So in the sort of 1840s, we were suddenly uh, realizing that if you ran a train from here in London down to Bristol, if we were running to local time, so Bristol local time was about 10 minutes different to London time, you'd suddenly have a problem of knowing what time to catch your train or what time your train was arriving. So it made sense. It wasn't quite a case of the train arriving 10 minutes before it left, though, was it? Well, locally, I mean, sun Bristol, as I've just said, is, is it sees its sun set, for example, 10 minutes after London. So it, it was, it, it's, you know, the concept of time, if you're looking at it from a clock, it was, it was... Mm running to a certain, uh, uh, the, 
the amount of time was the same, but the local time was different. We're fascinated with time, aren't we? I mean, and you, you're a creator of the, the, the Clockmakers Museum. We are, it's the one dimension that we can actually relate to our everyday activities, probably, isn't it? Uh, yes, I mean, people have been following the clocks increasingly over the last 200 years. The, the railways obviously had a lot to do with it, uh, factories had a lot to do with it, and uh, now, yeah, we entirely live our, our lives by them. Um, I'm not convinced there are huge economic benefits in the strict financial um, uh, sense of, uh, of changing the clocks around. I think it depends a bit on, on where you are in the world, for one thing. I think, you know, bear, you've got to bear in mind the important thing, I think, is we brought this in, not just in Britain, but in many countries, during the war. Some countries then dropped it, it was the First World War, I should say. Uh, some countries then dropped it and, and brought it in again for the Second World War. Now, why did they do that? Presumably because it was all hands to the pumps to make the economy as efficient as possible. I think that tells you a lot about it. Possible the government was completely wrong about that, but I think the fact that so many countries have followed suit mm. suggests that it does lead to some efficiency gains. Uh, and particularly in, in terms of energy consumption, again, the evidence is mixed because it depends where you are. Some places in America will tend to use more air conditioning. Um, but in countries like Britain and certainly Norway and Sweden, I think the evidence is fairly strong of some savings in uh, in energy use but i don't think that's the important thing i think it's really about economics in the broader sense of personal well-being it's about efficiency in how you use your sunlight it doesn't make much sense to me to have a lot of sunlight between four o'clock and six o'clock in the morning when you've got so many more people up between nine o'clock and eleven o'clock in the evening so it's about efficiency of sunlight use um, but it's also about quality of life emily there's, there's a guy called dave rooney who's um curator of time at the Science Museum here in London. David's nodding, you, you know who I'm talking about. Um, he says it's all about politics and money. At the expense of health is my question to you. Well, you know, the data can be mixed on that. In certain areas, there's an increase in heart attacks, there's an increase in car accidents. Uh, there's even studied productivity and morality of decision-making at work. But especially with that spring forward, taking away that hour may have a pretty profound effect. Not that it's just the hour. I mean, everyone's had jet lag and, and mild jet lag, but I think it's just everybody at once um, getting that hour all at the same time. And I think a more gradual transition or just keeping it the same, maybe this, as you were calling it, British summertime all the time might be better for human health. David, um, are you following the debate? Sorry, you want to say something first? Oh, uh, yes. Well, it's been tried. Um, <clears throat> in the U.S., we tried uh, year-round daylight saving time in the 70s during an energy crisis in Britain. We tried what they called British Standard Time in 1968 to 70. And both times, it got a, a lot of negative uh, feeling from the populace and was uh, discontinued. I was going to ask you if you're following the debate in Europe where the European Commission is yes. telling all their countries that they should vote one way or, or the other, and the countries are saying, hang on, we need more time to think about this, which is quite yes. ironic in, in its own way. It goes back to the idea of it being sort of contentious again, doesn't it? Yes, and there's, there's a problem with that, is that if some countries choose to be on winter time and some choose, countries choose to be on summer time, you're going to get a patchwork of times, and uh, that becomes very uh, confusing to a lot of people, each country having its own time. Uh, what you have now in the EU is everybody is on the same time uh, based on their time zone. And in the U.S., we have 48 of the 50 states following daylight saving time, and so also in sync based on their time zone. So I, th I think, Christopher, you, you were shaking your head there about... If, I think what David meant, he, he backed it up by saying based on their time zone. Yeah, we all have the same time when the clocks go forward and back. That's yeah. standardised by the EU. Um, and I can sort of see some sense in that. I can't see any sense in what they're suggesting at the moment, which is that we, we all go to whatever the EU decides it should be. Uh, we seem to get along quite well with Britain having consistently the same... Uh, sorry, the, the different time to nearly the rest of the entire EU. Portugal has a different time to... Uh, to Spain, you know, it doesn't matter. If you're, if you're crossing borders, you're used to changing your watch, it's not the end of the world. I can't see it being a, a mad patchwork of different times because countries, particularly the smaller countries of Europe, they have a big incentive not to be massively out of whack with the countries that surround you. So I don't think this is an area the EU needs to be getting involved in. I'm wondering about clockmakers in all of this, because precision 
uh, is, is that the only reason that, that they have to be where they are, is to make sure that everything works like clockwork. Um, do they find it very confusing, do you think, that there is so much argument about, around all of this? Uh, well, I think, actually, if you talk about clocks um, and watches, I think today we live in a much easier world where a lot of people look at their phones or their, their Apple Watches or whatever to get network time, and that's automatically adjusted so that when we um, go forward or backwards with the hour change, it's automatically done. You wake up and the time has been set. Obviously, prior to that, with mechanical clocks and watches, it was a bit more of a hassle. You would also have to get hold of time from somewhere, so you might use something like the 6-pip service in order to actually listen to get an accurate time signal, to then set your uh, clock forward or your, your pocket watch forward, um, which is fine when you're going forward, but if you're setting your clocks back again, um, you can't always put the hands back by an hour on the clock. question here. Is it, is it clocks you love or is it the idea of time? Clocks. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Time, I mean, time is a concept I find quite hard to really understand anyway because it's, it's all around us, that, you know, it's within our body. It's, it, if all the clocks stop, time is still passing. But the um, wonderful thing about clocks is, is that you can either loathe the fact that time is passing, that tick, tick, tick or it can settle you down because you know there is that constant there that's my feeling anyway yeah well there's so, there's definitely something very soothing about the sound of a mechanical clock ticking through the passage of time i mean some people might not like that but i find it very soothing are, are we ever going to get to a point where we have global agreement about this I Chris, you first. I don't see why we need it. Um, I mean, obviously, the entire world cannot have the same time zone. No, no, that's no, clear. No, no, yeah. um, Although I think in, in China, which is such a broad country, they do just have one time. They do, and that's yeah. a big mistake because you have vast variations, but this is kind of, you know, the communist central mm. planning. They insist, insist on everybody trying to uh, you know, uh, be squeezed into the same box. Um, I don't see any reason to. I mean, there's, there's obviously no reason for countries that are on or near the equator to be putting their clocks forward or back. It's, this is a, a, a northern... Well, because they have southern. pretty much a 12-hour day, don't they? they have, exactly. It's the same yeah. every day on the, on the equator by, by definition, almost. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the countries need it, and the further north and the further south, the, the more you need it. Um, it seems to me that the objections to it are largely about, actually, the physical act of having to put the clocks forward or back and possible psychological effects um, from those. There are all sorts of benefits, I, I, I think, from, um, from having lot longer nights anyway, including health benefits of people being exercised and kids out, out to play and so on. But, you know, there are costs. There are costs and benefits. Uh, I think we've probably got the right compromise at the moment, but if we absolutely had to have the same thing, so we didn't have any moving of clocks back or forward ever, for me it would be British summertime all around. Emily, um... We're sitting around here talking about it. It's, it's, it's an interesting subject. It's, it's a fact of, of life. Why don't you just say to your people, the people that you deal with, um, you know, put up with it, get used to it. It's, it's, it's only an hour. Uh, certainly what we already do, because it's already happening. Uh, I guess my main concern is that modern life already has a tremendous amount of disruption to our natural circadian rhythms, and that affects the brain, heart, you know, heart disease, sleep deprivation, all of these issues with light, you know, too much uh, LED light at night and all these things that we don't understand exactly what they're doing to the brain. And this daylight savings abrupt transition is one more stress, one more circadian stress added to all of the rest. And for some people, it doesn't matter. They do great. They're well rested. They're early morning. People love the spring forward. But for certain people, depressed, bipolar, um, it's a really abrupt change. Um, you know, there's a kind of a funny, you say, oh, it's really nothing more than jet lag, but there's this funny sort of series, case series of people who flew from America to Heathrow Airport and wound up manic in the airplane. So it can have a tremendous impact on human psychology. David, are we ever going to stop talking about it? Well, it's been a, it's been a big topic for 100 years, and I think it's going to go on for a while. We'll see what happens. As you said, they're talking about having it now in Japan to help the Olympics uh, keep it cooler in the middle of the day. So there's a lot of different uses of it. It affects different countries in different ways. And many countries think one benefit is it gets people out in the evening. 
And other, other countries think it reduces traffic accidents, another good benefit of daylight saving time. And of course, energy, as we mentioned, there's a lot of different benefits. And so it's probably going to be contentious for a long time. And what for you is the fun of it, the interest? Well, I just think it's a fascinating subject because it affects everybody. Uh, it affects over a billion people in the world for over 100 years, and everybody has a different opinion on it. So it's a fascinating subject. Okay, listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, the contentious subject of daylight saving uh, from David Prayer out there. Emily, thank you for your thoughts on what it does to our heads, to our bodies. Christopher and uh, Anna, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're never going to fall out of love with clocks. That's why you're cur curator of the, the Clock Makers Museum. Go and see it. It's, it's in London. But we have, unfortunately, um, yeah, we've run out of time. That's it from my guests. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for watching. I'm David Foster from the team that put this round table together. Thank you very much indeed. But time flies and so must we. Bye-bye.